professor in the Department of Anthropology here at the University of Maryland, and um, he is an expert in ecological anthropology, and his research, research explores the social and ecological dynamics of farming and foraging societies uh, in the present and also in the past. So his work is also has a very strong historical component. And uh, 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 before coming to the University of Maryland, uh, a, he was a, a, a research, a, a postdoctoral, uh, or a research associate a, a, in England at the Institute of Archaeology of the University College in London, and where he had two uh, research projects that are very interesting. Uh, one of them, a, 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 in, in one of them, he was investigating in the European Neolithic period on, uh, with a European Research Council funded uh, advanced grant. And the other one is a, is a research project in collaboration with uh, scholars from the University of Arizona and funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, which is a, a project to develop a computational linguistic methods and to uh, analyze the demographic history of uh, the Nusantangara uh, in Indonesia. Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Downey uh, received uh, his PhD in anthropology from the University of Arizona in 2009 and his MA in anthropology from Northern Arizona University in 2003. And he also holds a BA in archaeology from Boston University. And today, uh, uh, he's going to be uh, talking about uh, 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 the, uh, uh, Sweden agricultural practices among the Maya people. And the uh, title of his uh, presentation is Resilience, Labor Exchange and Networks and the Historical Ecology of Ketchi Maya Sweden Agriculture. Okay. Well, thank you. That was a nice introduction. I appreciate that. Yeah, so lots of different projects over the years. Um, the one I'm going to talk about today is maybe the one that's closest to my heart. I've been going to Belize uh, since 1987, actually. Um, not as a researcher, of course. I went first as a tourist with my father, uh, so I owe him uh, for much of my interest in anthropology. He got me traveling at a young age, but in the mid-2000s, I got the opportunity to start some research. And I figured a country that I knew and had visited many times over the years would be a good place to do it. So I went to the southern part of the country to do this, uh, okay. to do this uh, talk. Uh, excuse me, this research. So as he said, the, the title of the talk is "Resilient Networks in the Historical Ecology of Kekchi Maya Sweden Agriculture." It's based on my dissertation field work in the Toledo district in southern Belize, and it's my attempt to begin grappling with uh, the carrying capacity assumption that underlies Sweden agriculture. So in my mind, or my view, um, carrying capacity is it's a somewhat limited perspective uh, that does not really acknowledge the creativity and resilience with which rural communities interact with tropical forests and with the wider economies that they have uh, available to them. So this work is sort of a preliminary attempt at trying to tease those uh, forces apart, probably like many of you are also trying to do in your work. Um, before I start, I would like to thank uh, the Latin American Studies Center for inviting me uh, to give this talk today, also for the affiliate status. Um, it's great to have uh, an organization like this for researchers that are interested in this part of the world. So thank you very much. Um, just briefly, here's an outline of this presentation. I'm going to start off talking about a couple divergent theoretical perspectives on Sweden and then provide some ethnographic background and talk a bit about ethnohistory, land use, labor exchange, leadership and cosmology among the Kekchi. I'm going to introduce what I'm calling the conservative Sweden hypothesis and then finally I'll present some data which I collected in 2011 to help reinterpret uh, Kekchi ethnohistory in the context of this, this hypothesis, this conservative Sweden hypothesis. So I'd like to begin by showing a picture of what I believe this is maybe, can we, can we turn on all the lights for a second? It's good. Yeah, that's probably a good moment. Okay, I'd like to begin just by showing a picture that I believe illustrates a couple of the unresolved questions about Sweden. This is the, the border region between Belize and Guatemala, um, just a Google Earth image actually, quite a nice one. And it happens to include one of my study villages uh, up here in this area. And what's important here though are a couple striking observations. Uh, first is the dramatic deforestation on the Guatemalan side of the border, um, which is caused by cattle ranching and a relatively intact forest on the Belizean side. 
Um, and then the second observation is that the Belizean forest is characterized by this patchy mosaic of agricultural fields. And so there are really two questions that I'd like to ask about this. First, anthropologically speaking, what do we know about the social practices that created this patchy mosaic of fields in Belize? And second, why do these practices appear to have had less impact on the Belizean forest than cattle ranching did in Guatemala? Especially considering that extensive cattle ranching is, is only a few decades old, while Swidden has been practiced in Belize for well over a century. So it turns out that Swidden agriculture was used to cultivate the Belizean forest, and it's a form of agriculture widely practiced in tropical parts of the world. Uh, it involves a process in which farmers clear small fields using rudimentary tools like axes and machetes. And planting in Belize is done with a dibble stick, which I learned to use along with my young friend Arnaldo here. But Swidden agriculture, otherwise known as shifting agriculture pejoratively, generally has a bad reputation. And it's easy to see why uh, if you see its effects on old growth tropical rainforests. This is my field assistant Juan, uh, actually Arnaldo's father. And when I took this photo, we were mapping fields around the village in the, the Google Earth image I showed you a minute ago. Um, and we stumbled across this 100-year-old emery tree, which had been cut down and burned to plant maybe two seasons worth of rice. So needless to say, uh, this experience sort of drew into focus for me how destructive Sweden agriculture actually can be. So a little bit of theory here. The two dominant uh, theories that are used to explain the human demography of Sweden cultivators come from either Thomas Malthus, who saw inevitable population growth leading to social collapse, or Esther Balzerup, who saw agricultural innovations permitting ever larger populations. Now, of course, in the humid tropics, agricultural innovation usually takes the form of a chainsaw or a bulldozer, and uh, the consequence of this is an increasing rate of deforestation, as we all know from work in Brazil. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization institutionalized this idea that Sweden tightly couples population growth and deforestation by releasing the Tropical Forest Action Plan uh, to address deforestation in the tropics. I'm just going to read or uh, summarize a little bit of this. They say about two million people living in the tropical zone, uh, sorry, two million people live in the tropical zone where the population is increasing at a net annual rate of 2.6%. The increasing population, this is the key part, is exerting pressure for the use of forest land for agriculture. I'm going to skip ahead. And this is mostly due to the transfer of forest land to agricultural use through shifting and other forms of cultivation. So this was back in the 80s, um, and this basically matches the common public perception of Sweden, uh, but it certainly doesn't explain the persistence of Belize's forest as compared to Guatemala's, uh, or the frequency with which Sweden has been used throughout human history and prehistory. Over 20 years before the Tropical Forestry Action Plan was written, Clifford Gertz, uh, an anthropologist, addressed nearly identical criticisms of Sweden that we see in the TFAP. He wrote, quote, aside from the fact that most of these deprecatory statements are dubious and unqualified generalizations, they are not much help in understanding how Sweden farming systems work. Gertz saw Sweden as an integrated agricultural strategy that mimicked the forest species diversity, the physical structure of the canopy, and the above ground nutrient distribution. In other words, he thought that Sweden was better understood as a system by which, and this is another quote, a natural forest is transformed into a harvestable forest. Those are actually uh, Comte Utoma's words that uh, Gertz was citing. But one problem with Gertz's work and others like him, such as Harold Conklin, as well as a newer generation of political ecologists, is that they all sidestep this question of ecological carrying capacity. In all of these theories, there is either an implicit or explicit assumption of a mechanistic relationship between a population's rate of growth and the environmental ca carrying capacity, which is defined by the logistic growth model. As we know, this ignores both the complexity and unpredictability in many natural systems, and it also ignores the human capacity for learning and creativity. In contrast to this, Ecologist C.S. Hollings' adaptive cycle model predicts resilience in homeostatic cycling as coupled human and natural systems learn about fluctuations and adapt to them through time. This, I believe, um, no, thus, this, I believe that the central question of Sweden agriculture should be whether it is simply limited by carrying capacity or whether it exhibits resilience as predicted by panarchy theory. <coughs> 
So clearly a better model for Sweden agriculture would have important consequences, um, both for public policy and for the lives of Sweden farmers around the world. So to explore this question of Sweden's resilience, my study used ethnographic methods and social network analysis to look at uh, and expose unexpected hierarchical and dynamic properties within Kekchi Sweden labor exchange networks. That was sort of the central focus. Among the Kekchi, there is reason to believe that there's an internal logic to their form of Sweden that reflects Gertz's integral view. And this can be seen in the rituals farmers must perform along with their agricultural activities. The Kekchi use a form of balanced, reciprocal labor exchange commonly found in Latin America. And here you can see uh, a group of men that were invited to help plant this particular cornfield. Each of these guys will now have the opportunity to ask the farmer whose field this is uh, that their labor be returned uh, at a future point in time. The actual day of the labor group involves several ritual steps, and there are multiple taboos that the family must adhere to. First, the farmer's wife enlists help from family and friends to help prepare a meal. They prepare an altar within the house. And then the farmer cleanses the kushtals, or the seed bags, of the men that are helping him, helping him plant. So he's using a little copal incensario with copal uh, incense that's burning. And so he's purifying the, uh, the seed bags ritually. The significance of these offerings and rituals is to indicate to the spirit guardian of the forest that what will be taken from the forest will just be temporary and that the forest will be allowed to regrow. These spirits are called sul paka, and many different ones with different personalities reside throughout the forest. This rock here is the home of the tzul paka, the Santa Maria and Maknilha for Krike Sarko. Um, and when land around this village is cultivated, this is the spirit that offerings are made to. The, existing, the existence of these guardian spirits and the rituals to integrate them into planting activities suggests that Kekchi cosmology symbolically encodes a conservative environmental ethos. But there's a couple problems with this idea, however. First, the Gertzian Sweden framework has largely been discredited by most anthropologists because it assumes that Sweden societies are regulated by natural processes that keep their society in balance or equilibrium with nature. Second, and specific to the Kekchi case, Maya cosmology has never been connected functionally, that is to say, in more than the symbolic manner that I've just described to agricultural activity. The implication of these limitations is pretty clear. There's no convincing alternative to the prevailing discourse that's codified by the Tropical Forestry Action Plan, that is to say that Sweden only works if population pressure is low and land is abundant. And as far as I can tell from my read of the literature, this is because little progress has been made since Gertz and many others tried in the 1960s to, as Gertz said, help understand how Sweden works. So this is the basic question that I'm trying to address in my research. So to do this, my family and I went to southern Belize and I did field work beginning in 2005 in five Kekchi Maya villages of varying ages where the people rely on Sweden for both subsistence and cash income. Um, the study site was ideal in my mind because, as you can see from this Landsat image, the forest is in pretty good shape. It's relatively intact, you know, especially as when compared to uh, just over the border in Guatemala. So there's a, there's a lot of um, structure left in this forest. The most cited ethnographer of the Kekchi is uh, anthropologist Rick Wilk. He was also uh, an external member of my dissertation committee. And he points out that a historical perspective on the Kekchi is uh, very important. Because while Toledo might seem like a remote or untouched part of the, the rainforest, this is simply not the case. The people who lived here are undoubtedly Maya, uh, if you go there, that's quite obvious. But the most recent wave of immigration that resulted in this contemporary settlement pattern began actually in the mid-19th century. Since then, there have been repeated efforts to develop this part of the forest, and so just a couple examples. This is a, the remains of a steam boiler from Dolores. This is the, actually the oldest settlement in the Toledo district, dating to about 1885. This is a, an undated logging chain, but clearly it's, it's uh, quite old from Grand Creek Village. And this is a saw blade from uh, a sawmill that was downstream from Creepy Sarco, which I dated to around 1908. Now the German influence in Belize is pretty interesting and relatively poorly documented in the literature. Um, 
Both the Kramer Estates in Dolores and the Steenbrug Brothers logging mills were established prior to World War I by Germans and subsequently thrown out uh, during World War I. Um, and of course, during this time, the Germans were very active in the Guatemalan highlands around Coban uh, in the coffee industry. So the connection is intuitive, but not many people knew that they were active in southern Belize. But in the context of Sweden, this raises interesting questions. Uh, for example, what actually drives Kekchi settlement patterns? Is it population growth and ecological carrying capacity that's suggested by the Tropical Forestry Action Plan? Or alternatively, is it the history of development and market incursion that provided wage labor for many Kekchi people? Based on superficial appearances, it would seem to be the former. Most of the villages here are small, between eight and 50 households. They're geographically dispersed. Um, and they're surrounded by these mosaics of fallow fields. And these first two characteristics are basically, um, they basically fit the description of low population and abundant land that are codified by the Tropical Forest Reaction Plan. <coughs> Unlike other Belizean settlements in the Toledo district, uh, the Kekchi settlements uh, are small villages, the other settlements are larger towns, and these, these villages tend to maintain their sort of uh, village character. And finally, interestingly, there are many abandoned villages sort of scattered out through the forest. So the first part of my study involved figuring out whether carrying capacity or market incursions and opportunities drove historical Kekchi settlement patterns. To do this, I documented the history of 12, the 12 southernmost villages in the district uh, using a series of oral history interviews. And I tried to recover as much as possible the reasons why people moved from one village to another. In other words, through my interviews, I tried to figure out whether people moved because the soil in their village was spent, sort of a carrying capacity hypothesis, or whether market incursions drove them to move around through the forest. Of course, there's no time for the details here. I'm just showing you the chart so you can see there's data there. Um, but the major conclusion from this analysis was that just two out of the 12 villages that I studied had clear evidence that uh, they had reached ecological carrying capacity. And that was the reason that these villages were founded. So very, in very few cases was ecological carrying capacity cited as a reason. My results also provided further support for Wilkes' conclusion that historically speaking, market incursions into the Toledo district were cyclical rather, rather than sustained. So the question that arises is whether, um, is whether if wage labor opportunities were transient, uh, I, I wondered what the Kekchi did when the jobs ran out. Wilk thought that the flexibility of Kekchi household organization helped them to move around and take jobs when they were available, but also to provide basic subsistence at other times. Non-market oriented subsistence, of course, largely involved Sweden agriculture, growing corn and ground foods like potatoes and cassava. And the way that Kekchi households went about solving the problem of organizing enough people to do Sweden was through labor groups that extended to other households. In the Marxian sense, these labor groups are the principal means of production for Kekchi Sweden. And, to provide, and they provide the critical link between nature and subsistence when wage labor is not available. So it seems to me that to answer Gertz's question and explain how Kekchi Sweden works, it's important to look quite closely at these labor networks. To do this, I conducted a household survey in five villages and 111 households I interviewed the head of household about a wide variety of socioeconomic, social network, and demographic data. The youngest and the smallest village I worked in was Lucky Strike, had 10 households, and was about four years old at the time uh, that I did the study. And the oldest was Creek Sarko, uh, which had 56 households and was 95 years old. I first needed to get a handle on Kekchi land use patterns, so in the survey I recorded the number of acres farmed by each household for the last three years. And so on this figure, the, the um, villages are arrayed, uh, arranged from the youngest on the left to the oldest on the right. And you can see that land use in older villages seems to be significantly less than all but the youngest village. Of course, Lucky Strike is low because there just aren't that many people in that village to do a lot of land clearing. In the context of the carrying capacity market incursion, uh, market expansion question, these results actually look an awful lot like carrying capacity has been reached in these older villages, that their fields are pretty much shot, the soil is depleted, and because they can buy food, the villagers are relying less on subsistence agriculture 
But in the context of panarchy theory, these trends would actually be called exploitation and conservation, right? Growth and collapse. Uh, they would, they're called exploitation and conservation rather than sort of growth and carrying capacity. So there's, what, what Holling has done is he's reframed these old sort of carrying capacity hypotheses in, in terms of cycles rather than limitations. Another thing that you'll notice here is that I recorded land use in Graham Creek both in 2008 and 2009. What happened was that after I completed the survey in 2008, something happened in the village that provided an opportunity for me to see how land use patterns changed. Earlier that year, the residents, the village's residents decided that they wanted to get a diesel-powered corn mill. You know, they had previously used the sort of hand crank mills. And they wanted to run this mill as a low-cost cooperative. So a man from the village approached the Guatemalan government and requested one. His request was granted, and without telling anybody, he brought the mill to a safe location, but on the, the uh, Guatemalan side of the border with Belize. And he called a community meeting. In this meeting, he, he proposed to run the mill as a private enterprise rather than as a cooperative. The village collectively denied his request, and I was at this meeting. Um, but instead of acquiescing, he took this mill to another village and his entire family went with him to take advantage of the economic opportunity that it afforded them. The exodus nearly halved the village's population. It's not a big village, it's small. So it went from 18 households down to I think, 9 or 10. When I interviewed people about this, there had been real concern that the village would have to be abandoned. And remember, there are abandoned villages out through, this for uh, through the forest, so this is not unusual. And quite conceivably could have happened in this case. But what actually happened when the families moved out of the village is that the leader went and simply recruited new families from Guatemala to come in. And the story is interesting precisely because the village did not collapse and it was able to recover so quickly. When you look at their land use rates in 2009, they actually chopped a little bit more forest than they did in 2008. So there are three things to note. First, this is a young village with lots of primary forest. Second, the village could have collapsed, but it didn't. And third, production re re returned and even exceeded previous years. Similar to the land use data, the Graham Creek story seems to validate this traditional view of Sweden as ecologically destructive. So, at this point maybe I should have packed up my bags, said Gertz was wrong. <laughs> said so the TFAP was right and went and spent my National Science Foundation grant out in the Keys with my family. It was very appealing and wasn't far away. Um, but instead I thought I would look a little bit at social networks. When I began my field work, I had a suspicion that it would be interesting to analyze labor groups from the perspective of social networks. And so one of the first things I did was to figure out whether networks were actually important to the Kekchi from their point of view. This isn't a given, of course, because uh, the existence of labor groups could simply be a way, as many assume they are, to increase a farmer's gross ability to coordinate labor, right? Get more men and clear more land. So I thought it was interesting, uh, more than interesting, important to know if the farmers themselves actually used their networks to diffuse information, perhaps, that would help them improve their farming. In other words, did it do, do these networks do anything other than just allow them to organize large groups of men? So I asked a very, very simple question. I asked whether farmers talk to each other when they decide where to plant their fields. And a clear majority, 64%, said yes. So this just indicates that there's information moving among <coughs> farmers about what goes on out in the forest, about their agricultural activities. So with this simple observation, though, it seemed like any patterns that I might find in Kekchi labor networks might actually signify something important about their agricultural function and especially about deciding where a good place to put one's field might be. So the next thing I asked was, if you needed 10 men to plant a field, who would you ask? So with this question, I'm soliciting the normative labor network, right? I'm not recording into specific networks, but I'm just asking who you would, who, who you would ask for help if you needed help. <coughs> and with this information, I conducted, excuse me, I constructed complete undirected networks for each village and I compared them. I'll spare you the details of how I did this, um, in, but just to help you read these diagrams, each of the little red dots is an individual farmer, and the blue lines connecting the dots indicates that the farmers mentioned each other in these elicited, these name lists, right? So if I, 
mentioned Judith, Judith mentioned me, there would be a line connecting our dots on that kind of diagram. So this here is Lucky Strike, and you can see that its labor network is highly interconnected. Uh, it's actually just one family, because the village is so small. Uh, one extended family, I should say. But when you look at the networks in the other villages, you get some sense of the structural evolution of Kekchi labor networks. They seem to begin highly centralized and bifurcate over time. Unto itself, the fact that networks split over time is actually uninteresting. Um, as village populations grow, it becomes increasingly difficult for farmers to maintain their networks because they involve a significant investment of time and material resources, as you saw before when I showed you the rituals and the, uh, and the preparations for planting day. But what's interesting here is how these networks seem to maintain the connectivity. Even in Creek Sarko here, which is one of the oldest uh, villages in the Toledo district. And by maintaining connectivity, I mean these guys here. The maintenance of network connectivity is an empirical observation, and these circles indicate farmers who work in multiple components. In other words, there's no reason why these linking farmers could, couldn't choose to work in either one or the other of the components uh, of which they're parts, and that would isolate these clusters. So in social network analysis terminology, these guys are known as cut points. So this analysis of na labor network structure raises two interesting questions. First. What kinds of social processes help Kekchi labor networks maintain connectivity? And second, does connectivity, including these cut points, serve any kind of functional purpose with respect to Sweden? So to better understand connectivity, I decided to conduct a different kind of analysis. Remember before that I mentioned that Kekchi labor exchange is generally thought to be a balanced exchange. And so from this point of view, it seemed like it would be interesting to uh, see how well the networks in each village reflected this social norm for reciprocity. So using the same da data set, I constructed more networks, but this time they were directed networks instead of undirected networks. And here's what I mean by that. Um, the networks themselves are too complicated to show this uh, and actually explain anything, but here you just see an example of a simple directed network with one reciprocated tie and one unreciprocated tie. Based on these directed networks, I calculated several statistics. And as a point of comparison, I also plotted the land use data here in a red dashed line. I showed you that, that same line before. The first network statistic uh, is hybrid reciprocity, which is there in blue. And this is the percentage of ties in each network that are reciprocated. And you can see that 42% of the ties that are reported for Lucky Strike are reciprocated well, and much of Kilpa, about 17% are. The general pattern is that reciprocity rates seem to decrease in the older villages. The next statistic is hierarchy, which is shown here in gray. Um, and this measures how each network is structured with regard to an idealized, directed, asymmetric network. And what I mean by that? This. There are two examples. Um, you can imagine a typical corporation uh, would have subordinates, and they should always work through their immediate superiors to reach or get access to higher level individuals. And they shouldn't make connections across the hierarchy. In other words, uh, E should not go up to A and ask for a raise. E should work through B, who should then go up through A. So that's a formal hierarchy. So the hierarchy statistic here represents how well the vill villages match this ideal, whereas a number one would represent a perfect hierarchy. Lucky strike is low because of the high reciprocity rates. Essentially, they're a perfectly flat village with respect to hierarchy. But interestingly, and, and this isn't really the received knowledge of, of um, labor exchange, of a reciprocal labor exchange, you, we see hierarchy increasing in the three older villages, except for in Creque Sarko. In general, though, the hierarchy statistic seems to increase in, with age. So the, the final statistic is network efficiency. This statistic is inversely related to the presence of superfluous connections beyond those necessary to maintain a hierarchical structure. So the idea here is that social connections are costly to maintain, as I've discussed, and therefore any connection in excess of the minimum is considered in a strict sense inefficient. So uh, if E here is reporting to B and C, 
from a point of hierarchy, this is redundant, right? You don't need this guy having two managers because that will create confusion. So we're just measuring that, again, on a scale from zero to one. Uh, in, I've plotted it here in yellow. And uh, what we see is a pretty clear increase in efficiency across all of the villages. And this actually resolves this issue that I had in Creek Asarco. Creek Asarco, you can remember the network is bifurcated into three, and that's the reason that hierarchy drops, because it's split so much. But when you measure efficiency, it accounts for the, for the bifurcations in that network. Finally, the last statistic is connectedness, and this simply reflects the number of completely unconnected subcomponents in each of these networks. And as we saw earlier, labor exchange nets never fully detach from each other, so in all cases, connectedness is one. The overall trend here is that we see a high degree of reciprocity in the youngest villages that quickly decreases. And over the same time period, you see an increase in hierarchy and then this interesting efficiency statistic. Okay. So now we have a tentative answer to the first question I posed earlier, which is how do catchy networks maintain connectivity? As demographic growth makes it difficult to maintain balanced reciprocity throughout the network, we see a concomitant increase in network hierarchy and efficiency. The second question that I asked was whether network connectivity had an adaptive function. And this is a little bit more difficult to answer. Based on my interviews, one of the major challenges is figuring out where to put your fields. In young villages, it's easier because almost everybody agrees that crops grow most reliably when you chop and burn old growth primary rainforest. But there's a problem in older villages because the fields closer to the village have already been cultivated and the resulting patchwork of fallow fields and secondary forest regrowth is less fertile. So this is what the forest looks like after about 20 years of settlement, and you can see how farmers have to go pretty far to get to the primary forest around the perimeter. You know, so they're walking two, two and a half kilometers to get to uh, this, this is the high bush over here. So in my research, I'm taking the village age as a proxy for the development of this patchy mosaic of fallow fields. It would be lots of fun to do spatial analyses of this using GIS, but I just haven't gotten there yet. Um, so I'm just using this sort of age as a proxy. Um, the older the village, the big and more spatially complex the mosaic. Traditionally, Sweden is thought to be an outward expanding cultivation system where economically rational farmers balance the time and effort of walking to remote, uh, remote primary forest against cultivating less productive secondary forest that's closer to the village. So this is central place foraging theory if you're familiar with human behavioral ecology. When the village population grows too high, close by land is spent, and primary forest is too far away, the, the theory suggests that a new village would bud off and start again in high growth primary forest. So I've represented that here sort of dramatically um, and dramatized the destruction of primary forest. I've represented the most intense farming activity around the perimeter here in red, um, and the arrow direction indicates the general outward expansion, and I've sort of labeled this the slash and burn model. But in the social network analysis that I just showed you, you saw a much more dynamic process where labor networks seem to have different configurations based on how old the village was. This seemed to suggest that something different might be going on. One possibility is that these networks are ecologically adaptive. That is to say, the dynamism we can see in labor networks has something to do with the changes that occur in the local landscape. After thinking about this for a while, and because it challenges some of the basic tenets of Sweden, I des decided to define what I'm calling the conservative Sweden hypothesis. The hypothesis simply asks whether there are properties to Kekchi Sweden that slows the outward expansion of the forest perimeter. The idea is that there could be inward rather than just outward forces in Kekchi, Sweden, and I've represented this in my figure by putting two heads here on the arrows, and this intent suggests that intense Sweden cultivation could not only occur along the outward outside perimeter here in the primary forest, but also closer in, in this sort of patchy mosaic close to the village. I'm actually setting a pretty low standard here, but it's been over 50 years since Sweden was described as a process by which a natural forest is transformed into a harvestable forest. 
yet public perception and policy remain mostly stuck in the slash and burn model. So in my mind, any evidence to the contrary would be a significant advance. Okay, so in summary, the conservative Sweden hypothesis would be confirmed by any evidence that showed Kek the Kekchi limiting their own use of primary forest. I was often told that primary forest is the most reliably productive place to farm, but I was also told that secondary forest could be as productive, but that it required a more thoughtful approach to locating one's fields, and that there was a slightly lower chance of success. Based on this, in my survey, I asked farmers which type of forest was most important to them. And it was really interesting when I tallied the results, 74% of the subsistence farmers, these are the people that actually rely on the forest for, for their, for their um, subsistence, uh, they valued primary forest and secondary forest equally. When I asked the non-subsistence farmers, these were the guys that, in the families that were doing crafts or wage labor, 66% um, of the non-subsistence farmers valued primary forest more than secondary forest. When I asked those people who thought primary forest was more important, why? They usually listed the many uses of vines and hardwood trees for home building and carving bowls for tourists, and the importance of numerous medicinal plants that grow only in old growth primary forest. Indeed, anthropologist Liza Grandia at University of California Davis, uh, anthropologist, uh, cataloged 232 Kekchi medicinal plants in the same village that I was working in. But it was surprising that a clear majority of subsistence farmers told me that primary and secondary forests were equally uh, important to them. And this gives credence to this idea that Kekchi Sweden may not be just about farming in the primary forest. So now I can reframe one of my earlier questions and ask whether labor network connectivity supports the conservative Sweden hypothesis. The survey data suggests that secondary forest is nearly as important as primary forest for subsistence Sweden. And because the mosaic is more ecologically complex and riskier to farm in, perhaps the bifurcated networks and cut points support this. As I said, I'm framing this as a hypothesis. The survey results are suggestive, but I need to do more work on this, specifically looking at patterns of land use and whether that correlates with success uh, throughout the forest. It's future work. So I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and talk about Kekchi leadership. <clears throat> the traditional leader in most of these villages, or in all of these Kekchi villages, is uh, an alcalde. Um, for the purposes of this analysis, his most important duty is to arrange all of the men in the village for a mandatory labor group called a fahina. This is used to clean and maintain the village commons. It's all common property. If the alcalde calls a fahina, all the men in the village are required to um, attend, and otherwise they can be fined. So there's sort of a martial component to this. And so this alcalde can actually command a substantial labor force. From the point of view of Sweden, the problem with alcaldes is that they never prevent a farmer from cutting too much forest. This is interesting because one theory we have for explaining how small-scale societies can maintain open or common property resources like the forests around these Kekchi villages is if they have some mechanism to monitor and sanction people who take too much out of the forest commons for themselves. This is, of course, part of the late Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom's theory of common property resource management. And unfortunately for the Kekchi, the ethnographic data that I've collected doesn't suggest that their leadership norms fits this model. But I think there might be a good explanation for it. The first thing I'd like to show you is to return to the social network analysis we saw earlier and simply overlap the position uh, of the village leaders onto the labor exchange networks at the time the survey was conducted. When you do this, you can see how the location of village leaders moves to the periphery of the network in the older villages. Okay? So there's two kinds of leaders. There's the founder of the village and the alcalde. In the young villages, they're at the center. That's usually the founder of the village con commands or controls the labor network, um, or is the most connected, I should say, uh, in the labor network. But as the villages age, we see the leaders moving out to the periphery. So this is the observation. And I also can add in the cut points uh, here that I showed you earlier. And you can see that they never overlap with the leadership roles or positions. In light of this pattern, it's also interesting that several alcaldes told me that the most difficult aspect of their job was having to remain in the village because it kept them from their fields. So based on these observations, there seems to be a disassociation of Kekchi leadership from the center of these labor networks. Why might this be? 
Again, I'd like to frame this as part of the conservative Sutton hypothesis and suggest that hierarchical stewardship might not be preferred by the Kekchi. If the alcalde who organizes the fajina was also central to the labor network, he might be able to exploit this overlap of power and increase Sweden cultivation. Since alcaldes would be unlikely to sanction themselves, the man who assumes this responsibility is at least temporarily moved to the periphery of the labor networks to keep the hierarchical leadership separate from the means of production. If this didn't happen, not only could he use his power unfairly, um, if taken too far, it could even speed up the rate of chopping of primary forest. But this means that he's poorly positioned to monitor the forest. And because of this, the leadership norms of monitoring and sanctioning have not developed in the village. So this might explain why alcaldes don't protect the forest from overuse, but it leaves open, of course, the question of how the Kekchi might prevent abuse of the forest commons without hierarchical leadership. And this is obviously quite an important question to answer for the conservative Sweden hypothesis. So we need an alternative explanation for environmental stewardship. I would suggest that one can be found by looking back at my reciprocity analysis, labor exchange norms, and Kekchi cosmology. Bear with me here. Um, if you remember, reciprocity rates decreased in older villages. Typically, this is seen as a breakdown in the traditional form of agriculture, or perhaps if you favor Solon's social teleology, uh, the development of generalized reciprocity. But what if this wasn't the case? What if the binary opposite to reciprocity, and I can find no better term for this than anti-reciprocity, had a functional role in Kekchi conservation, and perhaps served as a substitute for hierarchical monitoring and sanctioning? So I asked about this during my field work, and when I frame several observations, ethnographic observations, in terms of binary oppositions, it actually sheds some light on this question. It turns out that labor exchange is primarily used for subsistence-based maize cultivation. And if a farmer wants to cultivate a field for the market, say rice, or needs to uh, clear pasture for cattle, men performing this labor almost always demand cash payment. So it seems that reciprocity is only extended to farmers for cultivating the forest for subsistence production, which is a satiable demand. And it's not extended when a farmer is trying to cultivate the forest for the market, which is not satiable. If you accept this idea of binary oppositions, then anti-reciprocity correlates with cultivating forest for the market. And this begins to illustrate, illustrate some of the norms we would expect of a social practice that limits the abuse of a common property resource. Don't help people who chop too much forest for the insatiable capitalist market. So if you leave the market out and consider just subsistence maize cultivation, any farmer who considered another farmer as chopping too much could simply refuse to help by violating the norm for labor reciprocity, and this would marginally decrease the productivity of the other farmer. I've observed several socially acceptable ways for this to happen. Um, farmers can sometimes just fail to show up for a labor group, or they can also send less efficient sons, they send a little, a little child in, in the place of a, you know, a highly knowledgeable farmer. Um, and while a single farmer doing this might not really affect one's ability, to cultivate a field. If a significant portion of the village refused to help, it really can cause trouble. Indeed, this description actually matches rather well to a process called graduated sanctioning, which Eleanor Ostrom proposed as an alternative form of commons management within groups of natural resources. It's also important, uh, it's also suggestive that Kekchi cosmology and offerings to the Tsultaka fit into this mi model of binary oppositions. It's important when a farmer makes offerings to the tsultaka that they're sufficient and that the ritual is done diligently. If they're not, the farmer risks offense and having a forest animal sent to attack him while he's out in his fields. This is interesting because the manner of these rituals and offerings fits this binary opposition model. If you make appropriate offerings to the tsultaka, uh, he or she will reciprocate with good crops, but if you neglect the tsultaka, uh, he or she will not reciprocate and instead punish you. And I can tell you suffering a fair to land's bite out in the forest would seriously limit your agricultural productivity. 
By examining Kekchi ritual in this manner, it also provides an explanation for why it might be important for Kekchi labor networks to maintain connectivity. Many of these offerings are made in public, and the altar itself is usually located in a public part of the house. And this means that if a farmer lacks diligence performing his offering, the transgression will be seen. And if this is interpreted by others as indicating a potential for overusing the forest, they might choose to sanction him. So the public aspect of Kekchi agricultural rituals is also a place where well-connected networks could amplify individual action into collective sanction. If a single farmer feels someone is failing to respect the tsulpaka and the village is highly interconnected, other farmers will quickly hear about it. And even if they did not witness it, if they agree, they could also refuse to help. So what I'm suggesting here is that anti-reciprocity may be an underappreciated aspect of Kekchi ethnography. It's, it, appears, it seems to appear in unexpectedly diverse parts of Kekchi culture, including wage labor and cosmology. And when interpreted within the context of public planting rituals and highly connected networks, it seems like it could serve as an effective way to sanction farmers who push beyond the accepted norms for forest use. So at this point, we finally have another answer to the question I posed earlier, which was, does na labor network connectivity support the, the conservative Sweden hypothesis? And this brings me to the third component of it, which suggests that the Kekchi maintain the forest commons by purposefully violating the social norm for reciprocity and maintaining network connectivity throughout the village life cycle is necessary to translate individual refusals to help with agricultural labor into a collective sanction. As I said before, this is important in the Kekchi case because Kekchi alcaldes don't fit the standard model for effective environmental stewardship. They don't actively monitor or sanction abuses to the commons. And it turns out that this model of Kekchi natural resource management would fit quite neatly into what Ostrom called a system of graduated sanctioning. So very briefly, um, I just want to summarize the three components of this hypothesis. A, labor network structure changes over the village life cycle to encourage efficient exploitation of the secondary forest mosaic. B, the hierarchical leadership usually deemed necessary to monitor forest commons may be undesirable among the Kekchi because it would concentrate organizational power and agricultural power and possibly increase the primary forest exploitation rate and C, which I've just stated, uh, that anti-reciprocity may be a low-cost and non-hierarchical way to defend the commons. In the beginning of the presentation, I showed some ethnographic evidence that actually seemed to fit this sort of slash-and-burn model, this traditional tropical forestry action plan model. To finish up, I would like to reinterpret that evidence in light of the conservative Sweden hypothesis. It seemed like this geographic distribution of small and isolated villages supported the idea that carrying capacity drove settlement patterns. If you remember, land use rates were high in young villages and low in old villages, presumably because of the depleted soils. But in the context of the ethnohistorical analysis, Old Machakilha was the only village on the map to have been abandoned because of real ecological carrying capacity issues. The land use data and the oral history data are a little bit out of sync. The stories don't add up. The other finding that seemed to implicate Sweden as exploitative was the rapid recovery after the Graham Creek cornmill incident. But the conservative Sweden hypothesis suggests that there might be a more nuanced interpretation to Graham Creek's land use patterns. The undirected labor network analysis suggested that labor networks in general look different in older villages than in new villages. They developed higher anti-reciprocity rates and fragmented yet connected labor networks which separate formal from formal village leadership structures. And intriguingly, these changes seem to correlate with the development of the, for the secondary forest mosaic around the village. It's important to reiterate that these defining characteristics of the conservative Sweden hypothesis only develop later in the village life cycle. So from this point of view, the Graham Creek corn mill incident must be viewed quite differently. The village had not gotten to the point in its life cycle when it would be expected to develop conservative characteristics. I got the opportunity to test this hypothesis when I returned to the village in 2011 
and conducted this, a survey for the third time. From conducting the survey previously, I knew that land use rates were increasing in the three years prior to the Cornwall incident, and that it declined uh, the year that it occurred, and that there was a rapid return to exploitation after the new villages re were recruited, so much so that the clearing rates actually exceeded earlier levels. But ultimately, the data from 2011 showed, uh, that I'm showing here in red, show a decrease in land use. Um, back down to original levels and a little bit lower. But ultimately, um, what we saw, though, is that land use decreased, and this is in accord with the conservative Sweden hypothesis. All of these land use patterns, though, are driven by the networks that underlie them, of course. Um, and here, we can see uh, what the networks looked like leading up to the incident. Immediately after the schism occurred, I recorded an increase in labor reciprocity as everybody pulled together. And this, of course, explains the uh, increase in land use rates. And at this point in time, this was before I went back, I actually wrote down a prediction, unusual for anthropologists, but I wrote down a prediction based on this uh, hypothesis of what should happen. And the conservative Sweden hypothesis um, would predict that over time reciprocity should decrease as hierarchy and efficiency increase. And when I went back, that is indeed exactly what I recorded. So I would suggest that this is evidence that the resilience of Graham Creek's labor network contributed to its ability to continue Sweden cultivation even after a serious demographic shock. In the context of the conservative Sweden hypothesis, this capacity should be seen as preserving the village's progress towards reaching a later stage in the village life cycle when its form of Sweden would transition from outward expansion to inward conservation. But what about the rest of the settlement events that were driven by market expansion and not ecological carrying capacity? How should this history be interpreted if one were to accept the conservative Sweden hypothesis? This is where it gets really interesting in my mind. Um, consider what happens if market opportunities speed up the rate of resettlement. If these market incursions accelerated Kekchi settlements, as they seem to have done, the conservation of primary forests seen in the later stages of the village life cycle would have been deferred. The actual rate of subsistence level Sweden cultivation would have remained steady, but because economic opportunities required migration, the rate of primary forest exploitation would actually have increased. By resettling sooner than they normally would have, Less cultivation was done in the secondary forest mosaics, and more of it was done in the primary forest over the long term. So while Kekchi Sweden is the proximate cause of historical tree mortality in the Toledo district, the rate of primary forest deforestation has been significantly faster because of the periodic market expansions into the remote parts of the Toledo district. This is one of my major So, in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that this study has actually made some progress developing a better understanding of, quote, how Sweden works, as Gert said in 1963. My exploration of Kekchi labor exchange networks has suggested that Kekchi Sweden may be a bit more sophisticated than the simple slash and burn model. And because I'm proposing a rather dramatic reinterpretation of subsistence-oriented Sweden agriculture, I framed it as a hypothesis. Even so, however, there seems to be evidence for it. The social network analysis indicated that uh, labor network structure is dynamic and increases the resilience of Sweden generally. The survey data indicated the, the uh, agricultural importance of the secondary forest mosaic. I've suggested that anti-reciprocity might be an alternative to hierarchical monitoring and sanctioning for effectively managing the forest commons. And I've sketched out how Kekchi cosmology seems to parallel the patterns of reciprocity seen in labor exchanges. And finally, I've shown how this even begins to give functional significance to Kekchi rituals. But I hope this isn't taken as simplistic functionalism. I've really tried to avoid this uh, by contextualizing all of this within an ethno-historical analysis of village resettlement and market expansion. The result of this, I hope, is a more accurate picture of the Toledo District's land use history, which accounts for the importance of markets, 
as the ultimate force of deforestation and a more sophisticated explanation of the adaptive properties of Kekchi Sudan. All right, so we have quite some time for questions uh, and uh, clarifications, uh, comments, so I open it. Hi, thank you for the really interesting presentation. Um, I found the hypothesis about anti-reciprocity to be really fascinating, but it would seem to me to, it would be important to elaborate on the market opportunities that farmers have. So if you're saying that farmers can decide whether or not they need, they will participate in this cash exchange, right? If you're saying that farmers can say, well, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to labor for you, I'm not going to take your money because you're abusing the forest. What well, else can the farmers do? It would, no, it doesn't apply to cash transactions. It's only for subsistence-oriented labor, ex labor exchange production. I see. So in the, in the case of the cash transactions, how does that work? It's a totally different system. They work if there's money there. Yeah, it's sort of straight up capitalist economy. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Can you say something about the nature of this wooden agriculture? What, what was their rotation time? Uh, was it they planting for about two or three years and leaving it for 15 fallow, or how, what were the pressures on the balance of production and fallow? Right. Um, typically there's two planting seasons, um, spring and, and fall. Um, in Creek Sarko, the oldest village, um, the fallow cycle was sh shorter than it should be. Okay. You know, there was certainly pressure, you know, sort of the typical expected pressures they were um, Probably, I, I shouldn't generalize. I don't have the statistics on the on the top of my head. Did they it's allow probably the to regrow? They did. You know, I think it's, if I'm remembering the statistics right, it was probably six, seven, eight years. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would have to go back and get yeah. back to you with specific data on that. And mostly for corn production or corn beans? Well, squash? this is the thing. I mean, it, it, it's a mixed economy. They're okay. mixing subsistence and market-oriented production. Mm -hmm. Lots of really giant rice fields in some of the areas. Yeah, you that. Um, if it was all corn production, it would be a totally different story. Mm -hmm. you know, I think they would be following much longer. Okay. Um, cattle pastures really making significant incursions mm -hmm. even into the remoter villages. Uh -huh. um, so it's a complex economy and, okay. and I've had to sort through some of that for sure. So the market then, because it's market based in part, yes. that's having an influence on what Absolutely. they're growing and how yeah. long they're following. The time frame of the, my study, I mean, I'm trying to get at sort of normative patterns here. I mean, yeah. the forest is getting hammered yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for many reasons. The government's trying to privatize it. There's national parks, there's oil exploration, there's you know, really significant global geopolitics going on in this part of Belize uh, in the last 20 years. So it's much mm -hmm. more complicated. I, this is an ethno-historical study, so I'm looking at you know, basically 1880 up through present and trying to get at the normative practices. Yeah. Um, really not getting involved specifically in sort of the, the contemporary challenges that mm -hmm. they're having. Mm -hmm. I could get back to you with the fallow cycle data. No, it's I really interesting. I was, yeah. um, just as a follow up on this, is, is there any mechanism that you saw for um, timing the fallow? I'm thinking of in Highland beginning where casuarina trees, which will be critical for building the fences to keep the pigs out. And they, in fact, the fit, the, it's considered fallow long enough when these thick casuarina trees are sufficiently large. So this is a kind of a homespun mm -hmm. um, measure of the amount of time, since they probably didn't do it in years per se, but rather yeah. Yeah. So anything like that. Um, I'm trying to remember, I, I didn't record any specific indices of when a field was ready to be recultivated. I mean, these guys are out in, in the forest nearly every day, you know, multiple times a week throughout the year. And they just, they talk about it very generally, like they just know the state of different patches in the forest and they seem to, because they're monitoring them over, you know, on a weekly basis for, for a decade, they know when to go back where. Um, in many cases, they know how long in, in actual years it's been. They don't really need indices, um, but 
I don't remember. Uh, it's not that I don't remember. I, I didn't record any specific mm -hmm. indexes. And one, one further thing to shout out. The, the, uh, uh, I was fascinated by the disappearance of, or the diminution of, of uh, uh, the reciprocal uh, labor pattern and reminded me uh, but it, of similarities but also differences. The work uh, by Charles Erasmus on the disappearance of the reciprocal labor pattern. Mm -hmm. If you found that, that this is a different system or it complements this approach. Um, it's really interesting in Southern Belize, it's not a disappearing system. I mean, labor exchange is vital in these villages. Uh, and the changing patterns that you see in, in the older villages is a reconfiguration of the networks themselves, not a, not a weakening. Mm -hmm. um, I know in other parts of Latin America, um, the system has actually been practiced less in more recent times. I, I, I haven't found that in Southern Belize, so I think it's actually a pretty interesting case study for that reason. Um, I also enjoyed the presentation, and I have an ethnographic question for you. What was the role of women in gathering um, agriculture in general, or maybe even in um, using or instructing people on medicinal plants? Was that any part of what you looked at? I collected fairly general information about medicinal plants. I asked about it in my survey. I didn't investigate it in detail. Um, a few bush doctors that I interviewed brought up specific remedies, like I have the, the snake bite remedy. <laughs> I think I'd go to the hospital personally, but he seemed, uh, he seemed fairly convinced that it would work. Um, but it wasn't a subject of my, my own investigation. Women's roles, um, again, you know, I was focusing on what happened out in the forest, which happens to be what men did. Um, in some of the, it was actually interesting, in the more remote villages, uh, Machakilha and Graham Creek, Women were more actively involved in cultivation, and, and historically, like 50, 60, 70 years ago, uh, what would happen would be that the farmer and his family would actually go to the fields, and they have they build like little little palapas, uh, corn corn houses, um, and that's where they would dry the corn after it's reaped. Uh, but they would also stay in them as families, so they would go out for two or three days as as a family unit. Uh, and so the the women were actually very involved in the farming process. But I didn't that doesn't happen or wasn't happening when I was there. So it shifted. Much. That's interesting. Yeah, like I say, in the, in the more remote villages, they were more involved. There were some women that went out and planted mm -hmm. and reaped, um, but not so much. Not so much in the, the, the easier to access villages. Um, there is some hesitation uh, on the part of men to have women in the fields that I've run into to like field assistance. Um, of course, as outsiders, they make exceptions, but. Uh, I had a female field assistant at one point, and she was uh, kind of looked at askance when I suggested that she come out and help plant, and those kinds of things. So there are definitely- That's an interesting finding in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, it happens. I, I haven't exactly reconciled the, the, the gender roles in the respect of that. Yeah, it's just curious because sometimes women are um, at the other end or doing the work or sometimes are involved in many parts of Latin American the medicinal plants and the yeah. knowledge of it, not so much yeah. the shamans or the doctors. I was just curious. It's, it was striking how much the women, the wives, knew about what the farmers were doing, though. Because oftentimes, I mean, so these were household surveys, and if the, the guy wasn't home, which often they weren't because they were out in the forest, I would interview the, the wives, and they knew a lot about how many acres and where they were. I mean, they couldn't say it with as much precision, but they were very, they talked about it very clear. Um, it wasn't, you know, a real strict division yeah. of uh, gender division. Of labor. I, I think that's an interesting ethnographic finding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, I'm, uh, I was wondering on the, uh, the intersection of uh, Sweden ag agriculture and land ownership because when the villagers decide to move into the forest to open up, a, uh, um, I just, I, I understood that these are communal land. They belong to the villages, but my, the, what I got from your talk is that they relatively move, uh, relatively free. They can go wherever they want to. And I was wondering to what extent the practices don't interfere with the Belizean state. Uh, and, the, and the state the Belize government recognizes these practices and the, this land of forest ownership. Mm -hmm. Historically, 
the better part of Toledo, the Toledo district was Queensland. Mm -hmm. So it was a British colonial system and it was maintained as Queensland um, for most of the 20th century. And the, the Kekchi could farm it, it was $5. They, they had to pay a sort of a nominal land use fee, but it was government owned or you know, owned by the colony uh, and open access. So it functioned as a common property resource. Um, even today, the, you can buy a lease, so they're privatizing it by giving out leases, but the government maintains ownership of the lands. Um, so throughout most of the 20th century, it, it, it's, it serves as a common property resource. The, f the, the farmers could go where they like, um, they could move villages where they like, more or less. Um, Dolores was the exception, that was uh, that giant chunk of land where that steam boiler was, that was private property, and that certainly affected land use patterns in the district um, at a sort of a regional scale. Um, at the village level, they have a, as is quite common ethnographically, there's sort of a, a, a local conception of land ownership that's respected. So if you uh, clear, chop and clear a particular piece of forest, you own it um, with respect to other farmers not coming in and farming it until you, well, until you let, uh, let them have permission or your sons, you die and your sons let them have permission. It kind of goes that far. Um, so that's what they refer to as ownership. This is all changing. The government's trying to privatize through these leases. Now, the last 50, the last 20 years, it's just highly contested. Um, they found oil, like I've said, and then many Kekchi are trying to get leases because they, you know, the writing's on the wall. Um, they know that common property land is, has been good for them traditionally, but the trajectory is privatization, and just it doesn't. You don't have to go far into Guatemala to see. You know where they think they'll be in 20 years. So, so there's that, and then uh, the other really complicated geopol geopolitical issue is uh, is uh, land use. I'm uh, sorry, land rights. There's been several really uh, contentious land right uh, lawsuits that the Kekchi communities have filed against the Belizean government that have gone to um, very high level to the Supreme Court in Belize, beginning in the 1990s. Um, and those cases typically have been won by the indigenous communities. So there's two villages, Santa Cruz and Conejo, that now have communal land rights. They've surveyed a border around the, uh, around the village, and the village collectively owns the land. Uh, the, I guess the jury's out on how well that's going to work over the long term, but they are securing communal land rights legally. Um, but the Belizean government keeps coming back and suing and then not executing and then partially executing the court's orders. So it's just it's just an ongoing process that continues to unfold. It's very interesting. And there's a, uh, there are a conflict between different villages because they decide uh, to uh, deforest the same area? Or is there any way, any contact between yes. the different villages to resolve these disputes? Or? The, so the one village where I found really clear evidence that I, I classified as really clear evidence of ecological carrying capacity was old Machikilha. And I, I documented it, it's uh, in those interviews, that Creepy Sarko being the oldest village um, had used the land where old Machikilha uh, was set up. And it didn't cause problems for five years, but then the farmers started overlapping and it became contested. And ultimately, um, Ultimately, there's, there's, a, there's an amusing story that goes along with it. I won't tell it now. It has to do with the Prime Minister of Belize and fights and torn police uniforms and these kinds of things. Uh, the, the villages in Old Machiquila ended up moving because the, it was um, nominally the, the land that was owned by Cricasarco Village, but not legally owned. Um, so they relocated the entire village in the 1980s to another location. And that was because farmers were fighting over land. And so that's ecological at a regional scale like the truth. It's uncommon though, in, in the evidence that I collect, it's less common than, than uh, people moving around to get jobs and then farming n nearby where they've moved to. And as I said, that's what's, in my mind, if you were to do the math, you would actually see an increased rate of deforestation over time because of the, for not forced migrations, but by the migration due to economic uh, incentive. Uh, uh, you mentioned that there was British control at least for a good bit of the time, certainly when you were there and so on. Um, the Brits are famous for the Enclosures Acts, the, uh, and, uh, the tragedy of the commons in Ireland and Scotland and, and so on. 
And is there any uh, parallel using uh, wastelands ordinances and so on? That's a very common in British colonial governments to use it in the South Pacific. I just wondered if they stopped off in Belize and, and used it. Um, I've never run across wasteland ordinances in the archival work that I've done. Um, the district officer posted in Punta Gorda uh, kept pretty good records. Lots of them have been destroyed uh, in various hurricanes that came through Belize City before they moved the capital inland to Belmopan. Um, by and large, the Toledo district was, they call it the forgotten district because it was just tough to get to. I mean, the access was very difficult and you know, the, the Kekchi were really the only people that wanted to live there for the better part of the century. The missionaries were fairly active. There was a mission at St. Peter Claver in Punta Gorda, so there's better records from the church. But um, other than <coughs> the Dolores Estate, the Steambrew brothers who had a lease, um, and then uh, farther north in the district, there were other pieces of pro you know, private property that the government gave out. The rest sort of maintained its status as Queensland mm -hmm. for the better part of the 20th century. Uh, mostly due to neglect by the British. I have one other question. Regarding the kind of overall attitude towards wood and agriculture, say, in our society, it's a, sort of a view that it's not a good thing. But in terms of some of the new e ecology, e e uh, thinking in ecology about disturbance and recovery and resilience, um, it's been shown that perhaps some of these patches that are created and these disturbances may be beneficial mm -hmm. for the rainforest. And so it may not, it's beneficial to the people living there, it may also be beneficial for the natural system, that it's a dynamic thing, not a static mm -hmm. climax community. Does any of your work or uh, observations and visits there support that, that there is this, we should have a new view of Sweden? Yeah, it's a great question. That's. That's the, the view that I'm trying to build to. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, the, what I've presented here is mostly the ethnographic yeah. research uh, with some preliminary social network mm -hmm. analyses and quantitative mm -hmm. analyses and supporting roles. Um, but certainly what I'm trying to get to is a, uh, I guess, if, if you will, a resilience version of Sweden yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that looks at the system as a way of mediating these human environmental relationships in a, in a sophisticated way. Um, panarchy theory uh, is, is a, an adequate way, perhaps, mm -hmm. of thinking about the problem. Um, but, you know, and I kind of, the point in the talk where I talk about future work, uh, I think that's the point where, yeah. where I would point, where I would um, go back to. And, and what I think needs to be further developed here is, is understanding the mechanisms by which that ha happens. Okay, so yeah. one ecological mechanism that I think would be really interesting to look at is reseeding, of course, because in tropical mm -hmm. forests, you know, the distance mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. seeds can travel, um, I mean, they find that patches fill in pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, I would be interested to know how the, the um, seed dispersal rates relate to forest recovery mm -hmm. with respect to this patch, and if the productivity of the forest isn't, yeah. in some senses, greater or at least equal or comparable to yeah. primary forest. Um, you know, that's what they found in Indonesia, you know, that the yeah. species diversity of those forests is, is, is greater because they're maintained in these yeah. particular states. Now we're talking fewer maintain, uh, managed species here. It's typically monocrop corn mm -hmm. um, with other species interspersed yeah. uh, onto the field. It's not as complicated as when on from, uh, in, 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 in Carol Conklin studies. Um, mm -hmm. But I haven't done, I haven't yeah. finished the mechanistic studies yeah. yet. Well, we're getting a better, I'm a soil scientist, and yeah. we're getting a better understanding of how soils respond to such changes. Yeah. And the microbiological ones, there's nitrogen fixation going on, there's things we see, things we don't see. And these, in, these climates and these biomes are ones that are particularly fast in recovering as com compared to a desert or an arctic tundra these tropical environments can be very resilient, Yes, um, more so than we used to think. Yeah, I didn't present it. I have soil fertility recovery rates, and I think it was, I mentioned it to you before the talk, yeah. I have uh, 15 samples or so, and, yeah. and you see nitrogen coming back, yeah. and it takes, I think, 15 years to kind of approach right. approach what you would hope it to be. Um, so that would be the fallow, you know, the fallow cycle that yeah. they would be reporting, you would hope. But Well, that's the typical expectation in terms of soil recovery, yeah. maybe two or three years of use, 
yes. 10 to 15, 20 years of fallow, yes. and then you come back again, you've moved around on the landscape, you're back to part field one again. Yeah. Things kind of cycle that way. Yes. So humans are cycling at the same time the soil is cycling, or the crops and bio is cycling. Uh, I didn't do research, specific research, on labor exchange in Guatemala. Um, presumably they do. Uh, it's a really, it's a great question. I should <laughs> do more, more background research. Um, the villagers that came in to Graham Creek after the collapse snapped right into place. That's what that case study shows. And so they, they knew how they operated. Uh, and that network was able to kind of continue functioning even after half the village left. So the, no the cultural norms are certainly there. Um, but I haven't worked in the, any data that might exist out there on the structure of them in Guatemala into this. It's a good idea. Uh, well, I have one final yeah, question. Sure. I'm a historian, I cannot help by asking about it. You don't have to answer if you have no idea how to <laughs> answer the question, but you know, I'm sure that you know that the historians and archaeologists have been trying to decide the reasons for the collapse of Maya civilization before the arrival of the Europeans. Do you have anything to say or anything to speculate about whether your model of cons the, the, the conservative uh, hypothesis, mm -hmm. conservative Sweden agriculture, do you think that your model could be applied to explain what happened or what didn't happen uh, in Maya pre Columbia Maya yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. At this point in time, I, I would be hesitant to try to apply the model in the context of prehistory. And the reason for that is that it operates at a different time scale. Um, it's, what I'm talking about here is a marginal improvement in the productivity that could be expected from a landscape under Sweden. Um, it, obviously, if you pour too many people onto a landscape, the tropical forest, I mean, Carrying capacities exist. They're empirical observations. If you put too many people on the land, the forest will go away because they'll get chopped down. What I'm suggesting is that that those levels might not be as rigid uh, under some, some parameters, some levels of human population than we previously thought. And when you start talking about collapse of civilizations or, 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 or what have you, we're talking about centuries, um, populations growing at a whole different, uh, under a whole different set of parameters than what I'm talking about here. So I, I don't, I would be hesitant to apply the model immediately. So do you think that your model works better in small communities? I think it works better in the ethno-historical uh, context, in, you know, in the context of decades rather than centuries. And I also think it's more important with respect to um, policy, like, to, to what we're suggesting these uh, communities do. Um, very commonly in Belize, you hear calls for um, alternative livelihoods. They try to get people to carve bowls for the tourists instead of do student farming. Um, and it doesn't factor in this idea that, well, uh, the forest might actually be okay if they did student farming as long as they're not doing the cattle ranching. I mean, what's, what's really causing the destruction? Is it the, um, the fact that they're, you know, back to the patch dynamics. I mean, if they're starting to plop down small leases to those that can man, you know, wade their way through the bureaucracy. If you're getting these small leases scattered throughout the common property, how is that going to affect the long-term trajectory if, if all it took was two or three economic incursions over the course of 100 years to significantly change the rates of deforestation across the district? So I think you know, past and present, those are two scales of analysis that maybe shouldn't be blurred in this instance. But on the other hand, um, public policy should take note of this kind of work. Any other questions? Then, well, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much.